in, please note the exit doors, which are located on both the park, the park side and the JFK Street side of the forum. In the event of an emergency, please walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK Park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. And you can join the conversation online tonight by tweeting with the hashtag, hashtag JFK Junior Forum Live, which is also listed in your programs. You can also follow us on Instagram at JFK Junior Forum. So please take your seats now and join me in welcome, welcoming tonight's guests and fellows and study group liaisons, Miguel Undurraga and Abby Bloomfield to introduce tonight's event. Thank you. Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Miguel Andraga and I have the pleasure of serving as a liaison to visiting fellow Gary Cohn and formerly Vice President of the Student Advisory Committee for the Institute of Politics. And my name is Abby Bloomfield. I have the pleasure of serving for a superior fellow, <laughs> Senator Heidi Heidkamp. Uh, and I am formerly the chair of the Fellows and Study Groups program. And tonight we want to welcome you to this forum that is about <coughs> solving big problems. Tonight is a culmination of a first of its kind IOP policy innovation challenge titled Road to 2092, Save Social Security. So first we have Senator Heidi Heidkamp with us today. Uh, she is the former US Senator from North Dakota serving from 2013 to 2019. Um, she was actually the first woman elected to this position. Prior to that, she served as the 28th Attorney General and the State Tax Commissioner also in North Dakota. Most importantly though, she is currently a visiting fellow at the Harvard Institute of Politics. We also have with us today, Senator Angus King, who is Maine's first independent senator, serving since 2013. He is a member of the Armed Services Committee, the Select Committee on Intelligence, the Committee on Energy and Natural Resources, and the Committee on Rules and Administration. He was also the 72nd mayor of Maine, focusing on economic development and job growth. Governor, Between these governor, different- Governor, governor. Oh, governor, <laughs> governor. sorry, thank you. <laughs> Uh, between these different positions, he had his most important role as a 2004 residential fellow here at the Institute of Politics. <laughs> there you go. And I have the pleasure of introducing Gary Cohn, who most recently served as the 11th director of the National Economic Council in the Trump White House, where he oversaw the largest tax overhaul in the past 30 years. Before that, he served as president and CEO of Goldman Sachs for a decade. And as you can see, there's a theme tonight. More importantly, mm -hmm. he is currently a visiting fellow at the <laughs> Institute of Politics. <laughs> and lastly, uh, our host and MC for tonight is IOP director Mark Gearin, who was most recently president of Hobart William and Smith Colleges, and before that served as director of the Peace Corps in the Bill Clinton administration. Join me in welcoming these fantastic judges and panelists here tonight. All right. <clears throat> well, welcome everybody for the uh, first ever hackathon here at the Institute of Politics. And our thanks to Abby and Miguel and Luke and Neve and Ryan. Thanks for the housekeeping details. And to everyone here, welcome. The whole 2092 team that's been really working very hard to, to make this a reality. And we especially Thank our visiting fellows, Senator Heitkamp and Gary Cohn for their leadership and we welcome back Senator King uh, to, to be a part of this. So we have <coughs> a lot to cover. We wanna get right as quickly as we can to our uh, pitches from the various five teams that have been selected. And we wanna have some time as well from questions from the audience. Um, but we begin certainly with um, well, we're a bit distracted with our thoughts in Paris with a tragic fire in Notre Dame, certainly. This is an important issue here in the United States for us to consider. And the road to 92 really allows us to call forth some of the really creative policy solutions uh, that Senator Heitkamp and Gary Cohn have, have really drawn forth. We've had 28 colleges and universities uh, participating, 250 students, mm -hmm including four high school students who participated. And while they did not make the final five, 
they did take the time during their April school vacation to submit a presentation, to get on the tee, and to come 45 minutes from Mansfield, Massachusetts. And they're here, and let's have them stand up. Yeah, and there they are. Right, right here. <laughs> So each of the five finalists are going to have seven minutes to make their pitch. That includes inevitable interruptions and questions from our uh, panel of judges. So uh, the time will be tight. We will march this right through. But let me begin with a few questions of conversations uh, with our panel here. And, and Senator, if we could, Senator Heitkamp, if yeah. we could turn to you first. You've been uh, a great fellow here at the Institute of Politics in your topic with Gary has been a Intriguing one, well attended, the real State of the Union. Can you reflect on your study group and what the issues you really tried to unpack with students and guests of the IOP this semester? I think one of the great frustrations that I had serving in Washington, and I think it was true for Gary, is that we could see long-term systemic challenges that weren't getting addressed. You know, everybody's running to the bright, shiny object, and so we decided that we were going to do a study group that actually dug into debt and deficit, Medicare, health care, all of the issues that we've discussed um, during the study group. But um, I think sometimes we always felt a little discouraged at the end of them because guess what, we didn't offer a whole lot of solutions and that's why this hackathon, why the social security program is so important to us. So we want to show not only can we show the problems, but we can also offer solutions. And sometimes those solutions, the biggest challenge is political accountability and political possibility of those, not actually doing the math. So we're really excited you're all here and thank you so much for this opportunity. Well, let me build on that to Senator King as a former governor and senator. You've wrestled with big challenges, as Senator Heitkamp uh, suggests here. How do you think about big challenges from, as a policymaking? You're at the Kennedy School of Government in a matter of public policy. How do you reflect from your experience as an executive in your state and now in the United States well, Senate? Well, first, one of the most frequent questions I get is, what's the difference between being a governor and a senator? And we have 11 former governors in the U.S. Senate today and we formed a former governor's caucus, a little group that meets together. And I went up to Mitch McConnell one day and informed him. I said, Mitch, we're forming a former governor's caucus. He said, well, Angus, I've noticed if you have a governor who's now a senator and you ask them which job they like better, if they say senator, you know they'll lie to you about other things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought that was a, you know, sort of put it in perspective. Uh, in, in tackling a big problem, You've got to start with a vision. You've got to start with ideas. That's what you all are supplying with us today. You've got to have ideas and a concept of where you want to get. Too often people in politics, it's all about the office or the corner office or the good parking space. It's not about the vision. So start with the ideas. Collect the ideas. Then collect the team to hash out those ideas. And the team has to include people that don't agree with you. If all you have are people who agree with you, you're never going to get to a good place because you're going to stumble. We all make mistakes. If you don't have people who will tell you when you're wrong, you may as well hire mirrors. You know, <laughs> how am I doing? Great. Oh, you're doing great. Uh, you need people who are willing to buck the conventional mm -hmm. wisdom. Uh, and then the third thing you need to do is to start to reach out politically. To, to reach out and, and the arithmetic in Washington and in most states is you have to have support from both sides. Nobody, rarely do you have the majorities that you can just jam something down. Occasionally it happens, but not usually. Therefore, you've got to work, out, work with people on both sides. So I would say mm. vision, team, and assembling a coalition. Those would be the way uh, that I go about trying to uh, tackle a major issue like this. That's great. And Gary, uh, you're fresh off your conversation with Larry Summers in Act 10. <laughs> um, and you've, with Senator Heitkamp, have really tackled major issues in your study group. But you selected this one, Social Security, for this ha hackathon. Tell us about your thinking on that, why we're privileging this topic among the many that you uh, discussed in your study group. Uh, thanks, Mark. So for those of you that came to our study group, you'll know we started the, the, the study group off with the first session was, um, it was debt and deficit. Um, and, and we talked about debt and deficit, which led us to a conversation about taxes and spending. Um, we talked about our $3.2 trillion of tax revenue, and we talked about $2 trillion expenditures, one being Medicare and the other being Social Security. So in that wisdom, as, as, as Senator Heidkamp said, 
We just didn't want to talk about the problem. We wanted to help solve a problem. Solving Medicare, difficult, really okay, difficult. It's got one. all the problems Social Security has, plus a whole myriad of other problems, dealing with health care costs and all those issues. So in trying to come up with a problem to tackle, we tackled the second biggest expenditure in the U.S. budget, which is still a trillion dollar plus item, and one that has all the same dynamics of a problem that's growing, getting more severe, and one that is also going to run out of money. Um, you, all, you know that the uh, Social Security Trust Fund report says by 2034, if we don't put more money in, we're either going to raise the tax automatically or we're going to cut benefits automatically when we hit the date. So we decided that we should, as a, as a group and really as a, a community here, come up with a practical solution, and that's what led to this hackathon. And the winners will... Present well, there. We, 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 they, they keep getting new sweepstakes. <laughs> so Senator King has said he's going to present it as a bill. That was a, so, so now we've got a bill being Stakes presented. Stakes have just been raised. Okay. We've no got pressure. the winners going on MSNBC. So um, we, we've got MSNBC. Uh, Stephanie Rule is going to bring them on. Uh, we're going to take them down to Washington, and they're going to meet with a variety of legislators, uh, both in the uh, Congress as well as the executive branch, and we'll probably put them in front of some of the other public interest groups that have quite a interest in Social Security. Uh, you know, some of the retirement activist groups that have already come out against us a little bit, which is great. We've already started the political volley going. But look, this is an important topic because yeah. like 2034 in political terms is forever. In math terms, in present value terms, it's tomorrow. Right. So, you know, we have to really deal with this issue now. And if, if we get ahead of it, it's, it's not that difficult. Every day we waste is a day that it could have been an easier problem to solve. Right. So we have a little time. Let's go out to a couple questions. There's microphones here. Uh, and I would invite anyone who wants to ask anyone of our judges here a question uh, before we uh, get going. And then we'll go into the pitches here. Questions, anyone? We've and answered the them. Yeah. yeah. People, I think, want to get right to the pitches. That may be of course there. they do. There's one. Oh, we have a question right here for one of our teams. Yeah, the mic's right there. Uh, question for uh, Angus is, you decide to run as an independent, and I'm sure that that makes building a coalition simultaneously much easier and much more difficult. Uh, Why did you decide to run that way? That's, I ran for governor as I'm, I'm an independent. I, I was governor as an independent 25 years ago. And uh, at the time, I just didn't feel fully comfortable in either party. I was too socially liberal for the Republicans and too fiscally conservative for the Democrats governed for eight years as an independent and found that it was really a, an advantage in the sense that I didn't have to th think twice about who I appointed. I could appoint the best people from the whole society rather than just from within one or the other of the political parties. I wasn't sure how it was going to work in the Senate. Uh, I could have been a pariah. You know, nobody will do business with me. I had to choose to caucus with one party or the other. I had this fantasy of putting my chair in the middle of the aisle but that wouldn't work because you get your committee assignments through one or the other of the caucuses. So I had to make a choice. The Democrats reached out to me. Basically, they guaranteed that they would respect my independence and not lean on me uh, to toe the party line. They've respected that. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, my voting record is very confusing. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and it's because I just do what I think, number one, is most important to Maine and, and, and to the country. And sometimes I vote with the Democrats and sometimes with the Republicans, more often with the Democrats, to be honest, but uh, on a number of issues. And I find it, frankly, as a luxury. I've had colleagues come up to me, now I'm tap patting Heidi, she isn't one of them, but they have people come up to me and say, Matt, you're really lucky. <laughs> you know, you're in the right place because you don't have to go one way or the other. So, uh, and also 40% of Americans are unenrolled in the parties. Uh, I think I'm representing a significant slice of the people. All right, let's take one more question right here. Senator Heitkamp, how has it been like working with Gary Cohn this semester? <laughs> <laughs> and for the record, introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm Nevaeh, I'm a senior at the college. Yeah. And you've done a great job helping us with the hackathon, <laughs> thank you. Um, you know, it's a question that I get all the time and it's just been misery. <laughs> Misery. <laughs> no. I mean, I, I knew Gary, and I, I think the first forum that we did, I talked about um, our first experience meeting each other, where I had to convince him to divest uh, uh, Goldman's uh, warehouse full of aluminum. It all worked. Aluminum prices went down. Gary capitulated. 
And um, we got actually... Um, yeah, we sold to the Russians. Yeah, we did, yeah. Uh, okay. So we, okay. we actually got to <laughs> kind of understand each other and know each other. So we have a history before we got here. And when we both found out simultaneously that we would be invited, we said, let's do this together. Let's show people that there really is more to Washington than the bright, shiny objects and all the political intrigue and the, and the drama. There is real issues to be solved because that's what brought Gary to to the White House and to politics. That's what brought me to politics, and I think it's been, it's, you know, we don't always agree, frequently disagree, but for the most part, I think it's been a really fun experience. And Thanks before, I, with I've got to say that, that Heidi is one of the best public servants I've ever encountered. Oh. Uh, in fact, she's my wife Mary's favorite <laughs> senator. <laughs> And I've, I've seen her take very, very tough votes. And, and as you know, she lost her seat uh, because of some of those tough votes, I think. And that's, that's something you rarely see in this business when somebody knows they're putting their seat at risk, but they do the right thing anyway. Uh, as I was about to say, she's my wife Mary's favorite senator, <laughs> and that includes me. Yeah. <laughs> Your wife is shaking her yeah. head in agreement. Yeah. <laughs> OK, well, we want to really devote the bulk of this forum. It's a different format than past forums, but that is the beauty of this really brilliant idea that the Senator and Gary have really put forth, and so we're excited for that. So we want to invite our judges to take their seats. Um, we will go through each of the uh, various teams. You will have seven minutes to present your slides and your presentation. And as I said, understand that, uh, I guess I'm getting moved too. Um, understand there'll be interruptions within that uh, seven minute uh, time period. Uh, you'll be given a one minute warning. Abby has a sign there, one minute, and then end. And I would encourage you to obey the notice and the final notice of conclusion. Uh, and we have to stick to a, a rigorous time schedule uh, so that we can make sure that we get all five teams given the kind of opportunity they have. So as I said, this was a the judges said earlier to all the five finalists that it was a really difficult task. Those that preceded uh, these five teams here uh, in their presentations uh, were ones that they felt very easily could have been selected, but they had to narrow this field. So with our congratulations to all five and to the other 200 plus students that competed, we thank them for their initiative and for all the time they spent. So the first uh, team won we welcome from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, right down the road. We have Thomas Green, Nolan Hedgelin, and Nicholas Rothbacher. Welcome. This is Team One, Path to 2034, Vision to 2092. Hey, Mark, before yeah. they start, don't count this in their seven minutes. Can I just say one thing? So I think it's fair for those of you that weren't involved to understand how we got to the five teams. We got a t many, many proposals last night. Senator Heidekamp and I sat in this room last night and we really whittled the pile down on four or five criteria. Um, number one, it has to be politically feasible. So we weren't going to take any crazy idea that we didn't think could get done. Number two, it had to be mathematically sound. Number three, we gave a lot of points to credibility. I'm sorry, creativity. So we didn't want people to just come in and move the levers on things that we knew were the obvious levers. So we hope what you see in here is a bunch of creativity and ideas you haven't seen before. So that's how we got to these five. That's helpful. Senator, anything else? No, I go for it, okay. guys. Now you can start the submit. Team one. Do we Great. have another uh, microphone for these guys, you guys? Yes. There you go. Okay, Good. mark it set, go. Well, thank you so much for having us. So like I said, we're from MIT. We're all part of the technology and policy program there under the School of Engineering. I'm Thomas Green again. I'm Nolan Edgeland. And I'm Nick Rothbacher. Um, and our proposal is kind of broken down into two pillars. When Social Security was first passed or enacted in 1935, the economy looked much different than it does today. Work has changed. The way that uh, employees live out their careers has fundamentally changed since the time Social Security was first enacted. And the reason that we are at this crisis is because wages have fallen, they've become stagnant, and because fundamentally people do not work like they used to. So these two pillars are, are broken down to, into, into two basic things, a path to 2034, how do we make solvency for the system and create sustainability in the near term, but then a vision of 2092, how do we imagine a social safety net of the future? 
How does social security play into the gig economy, to work of the future? How do we have a, a support for people who um, are, are in less certain jobs and who have less um, clear career paths? So that, that's the approach that we take, and, and we'll first discuss our, um, our path to uh, 2034. So for the path to 2034, our goal is to kick the rock down the road at least 15 years so that we can open it up to a broader discussion about what a social safety net in the US is. Below, we've outlined four different policy solutions that are minimally invasive and politically viable because they do not radically change the tax structure in the US, and they do not cut immediate benefits to retirees right now. However, when compounded in our calculations, they have increased the lifetime of the trust fund by approximately 15 years. Now, this is important because we're trying to find something that we can do right now to implement a change that will give us more time in the future. Furthermore, we've chosen not to address putting all the trust money into a diversified portfolio and leaving it in government bonds because we believe that Social Security is supposed to be a safety net that is supposed to act as a safety net and when you put it into a diversified portfolio, you're incurring unnecessary risk in a program that is designed to make people feel safe when the economy is bad and they choose to retire. With this in mind, we'll now go to our second vision, which is for 2092. Right, so our, our goal with um, envisioning what we would do in 2092 was to bring in everyone. You know, currently the, the conversation is dominated by making sure that we get in the short term to a surviving program. But we want to move beyond surviving and we want to evolve the program into a thriving modern system that, that is focused on the way the economy actually works. So, um, you know, we've, we're, we want to incorporate some problems that we think are going to cause big disruptions to the way that work works. You know, the gig economy creates problems for workers trying to, you know, um, pay the social security taxes they need. They don't have the fringe benefits that allow them to save and not rely on social security as a, as a significant part of their income. You know, I, but, I'm going to interrupt you because um, we were really intrigued Right. Um, yesterday when we visited with you all that you had divided it and had recognized this work change. Right. So we were really looking forward to maybe seeing some more meat on the bones. Right. When you get to this part, your proposal kind of falls apart. Right. You throw up your hands and say, who knows? Right. I mean, you know, so the challenge was to get us to 2092. Right. We, you didn't really do that, though, sure. did you? Well, the thing is, we can't rely on any model to tell us how we're going to get to 2092. Because the uncertainties are so high um, and because there are so many dynamics at play, um, we but didn't you think... Know that, you know that, that the... the the, um, the workforce is going to change. That's you right. recognize it. That's right. Couldn't you anticipate what that workforce would look like and be a little creative in how you would address that social safety net provided by Social Security? That's fair. It, what, what we know is that people are increasingly relying on Social Security. So it's becoming a larger and larger part of people's monthly paychecks after they retire. And that is a problem because, like I said, people are not getting pensions like they used to. People are but, not but necessarily wait, wait, saving wait. for retirement. The 1099 like employees, the gig economy employees, uh -huh. right. they're self-employed. They are self-employed. They pay Social Security. Right. They do pay self uh, You pay the whole 12.4 yourself. Right. right. And okay. the fringe benefits that they do not get are the um, 401ks, the IRAs that should be a supplement. But they can invest to, in a SEP. They, they can invest in, in a retirement They can, they can set up a Keo plan. They can get up to $32,000 in a, in a self-directed plan. That's absolutely true. They can, but, um, <laughs> but, go ahead. Uh, but so we're it would have been nice the, to see those ideas. I right. Guess, no, is my what point. we're saying is that um, they won't see the employer match that a, a person in a salary job would see. And so we, you know, we're hoping to to not necessarily box ourselves into a particular policy, but we did think of a few that we thought okay. could be useful. So, Hurry up. you know, we could move the, you know, so on the more progressive side, you could see yourself moving to more of a um, accepting that people are using Social Security as a basic income when they retire and moving towards a more aggressive policy of either redistribution or a UBI, a universal basic income, some kind of um, policy like that. On the less progressive side, you could see yourself, uh, you could see the government um, implementing some kind of savings fund that um, gig workers or, or other independent contractors can, can use and that is subsidized for their use um, so they can take more individual uh, management over their funds and have a, uh, a more uh, robust way to retire. So one of the problems that we ran into is trying to model this problem for 2092 is that the models that we create in society exist within the internal structures of society itself. We cannot model something such as the internet boom 40 years ago. So why are we trying to model that right now for 2092? But you, you don't think we know how many workers are gonna be working 
sort of steady state, with the, the labor force participation rate's been pretty steady coming down because of demographics. Yeah, absolutely. We're at 62 but, point something percent of the population right now. But the job dynamics have been wildly different from the past 50 years is the problem. They have been, but participation rate's I, been pretty, pretty stable if you, if you back out age. I mean, if you look at, I mean, you guys are like, like the gig economy is something brand new, whoa. You know, if you look at the early days of, of small business, it really wasn't until the 1950s when you saw this huge influx of people basically being employees. Before they were running their own farm, they were running their own business, they were not, I mean, they were in their own gig economy back in the early uh, 1900s. So we know that there needs to be a social safety net that failed during that period of time. So, so uh, we, we like the fact that you guys have divided the workforce and really are trying to attack this issue, but we just don't see any real substance in, in your proposal to, so, to address it. Absolutely. Well, you, you are very substantive on the first part, on the 2034 part. Could you put that slide up again? Sure, yeah. absolutely. <coughs> you went to... Uh, They're a, done. You're a, done? A we progressive, are at, we are at seven minutes. We, okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank, you so thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, they went to change CPI, which is a non-starter. Right. Okay. Team two, which is self-described as Team Renaissance. Roy Liu, Abdul Hakim Bahari, Lucian Charlin, AJ Pascua, and Jeremy Strickland. They are representing Harvard Business School. Tell us when you guys are Harvard ready. Harvard Kennedy School and look, Harvard look. Law School. Let us know when you're ready, you and guys the ready? clock will start. Yeah, but we need the... Uh, yeah, yeah. Yep, they'll, okay. they'll. Well, then you're not ready. <laughs> ah, the clicker. <laughs> got, these guys have been rehearsing all day. <laughs> we step down at three minutes, and then we come back up at four and a half. It helps them know. Click, 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 click forward. Click oh. forward. Click forward. There, there you go. go. There we go. Perfect. All right. You ready? Go. Yep. In their hit 1967 song, When I'm 64, the Beatles once sang, will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? And as it turns out, unfortunately, 50 years later, these words still ring hauntingly true in today's world. Because seniors and young generation people all across the US are asking the question about social security. If current trends continue, social security will be completely insolvent by 2034. And at that point, only 79% of benefits will be paid out, and 15 million elderly Americans will fall below the poverty line. Fortunately, our team has come up with an innovative 3C bundle solution with three Cs for cultivating contributions, controlling costs of the program, and compounding capital over a period of time. We project that over the next 75 years until 2092, the combination of our 3C program will reduce the budget shortfall for Social Security by 168%. But there's two things to note. One is that there's the power of the bundle because of the complementary measures, and also the fact that there is a little bit of everything for both Democrats and Republicans in this proposal. And the fact that all the proposals are put together, the compounding effects on the third proposal will be massive. So let's jump into our first C, which is cultivating contributions. We propose to eliminate the payroll tax cap, but in order to sweeten the deal, we would decrease the personal tax rate of individual Americans from 6.2% to 4.7%. Is that both, both sides or just one side? No, just one side for okay. the uh, So employers for the still pay 6 too. Employees okay. pay that much, yes. So it would be just for individuals to 4.7%. This would mean that 96% of Americans get a generous tax break and that the top 4% of incomes actually uh, pay their fair share of payroll taxes. Next, we plan to eliminate the payroll tax exceptions for regressive salary reduction programs such as flexible spending accounts and cafeteria 125 plans. Because even 401k retirement contributions right now are subject to a payroll, for, to a payroll tax. And so we would decrease this to 4.7% for these salary reduction programs. Next, we would also apply a payroll tax of 4.7% to investment income. And this would include both cap, uh, capital gains, it would include also dividends and also interest income. And what we would do is we would peg this to the Medicare tax, which currently is subject to people that make over $200,000 in modified adjusted gross income. And so we would apply that only to those individuals as well for so, capital and gains. And that would be at the 4.7%. 
Exactly. Is that right? It would be at the 4.7%. Okay. So it, and it's, it's uh, everything. It's cap gains, dividends, and interest. Yeah. Capital All gains, under. dividends, and an interest okay. income. Okay. Yes, exactly. Change from yesterday. Exactly. Got it. I got <laughs> yeah. it. Okay. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, our second pillar, which is controlling costs, we have three solutions as well. First, we would slow the initial benefit growth for the top 50% of income earners by creating a bend at the 50th percentile, and we would phase this over the next 40 years. Okay. Next, we would also index the retirement age to demographic longevity indexes. So this would take into account both the, uh, the number of years on average that people work, as well as demographic trends for how long people live. And so this would automatically stabilize the system and Congress would not need to fight this fight about when social security retirement ages every year because it would automatically dynamically adjust. So when does this start? It would start, uh, it would start basically uh, in 2020 right away, but it would be phased out. And the, so uh, what, what, would be, what would be the effect for someone collect going on social security next year? Exactly, so it wouldn't have an immediate effect. That's the best part because what we project is that every two years, it would add one month to the natural retirement age. And so you'd basically add one year every 24 years. So this would be much better than if you just arbitrarily One year said every it. 24 years. Yes, exactly. And, and one, of, one mm -hmm. of the things we were looking for is, I think current uh, recipients really are challenged right now at the level that they're at. And I know a number of proposals talked about some kind of guaranteed increase. Mm -hmm. You went to chain, or you went to um, CPIE. Yes. Can you tell me what additional increase that would be in benefits? Right, so this would be our next slide, which is chain CPI yeah. and CPIE. Wasn't we're not nice of me to get you there? Yes, <laughs> exactly, thank you so much. Um, so basically, we're not suggesting that we go purely to a CPIE. We're saying we want to do a combination of the chain CPI and CPIE. So chain CPI. Why what, did you do that? Because the idea is that both of them were too extreme. Right now, if we assume that the inflation rate is, say, 2.8%, one would bring it down and one would bring the COLA up. And so one of them is actually a little bit stronger than the other. It would have a net effect of bringing the COLA down a little bit, but both proposals were a little bit extreme in our opinion. But, but if you yeah. went to pure CPIE, CPIE yeah. you probably have that much room because you went way over the cap. We right. could have that room. It's up for negotiation. But the idea is that the chain CPI... But, but understand this. Yes. We tried, or at least there was a huge proposal um, last time they looked at this to go to chain CPI. It's a political non-starter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. I will tell you it's a political non-starter. But yet you included it in a pretty comprehensive proposal right. when you didn't need to. So well, No, the, but they, they modify it yeah, by this that. CPIE. Yeah. It's not straight change CPI. Yeah, but it's, it, it's not the kind of dramatic We're not even allowed increase. to say the, does your, change Do you CPI? work to go to straight CPIE? Say again? Um, does your balance work at CPIE? Yeah. It does. Okay. It does, yeah. yes. Yeah. So we would do a combination of the both, and they would cancel each other out a little bit, and this would save 6% in the total shortfall. Um, and then the last, uh, the last third pillar, which we have, is the compounding capital. The idea here is that right now Social Security is invested 100% in Treasury bonds, and these are some of the lowest yielding but safest assets available. We would like to diversify this over a period of 10 years. And so we would ramp up so that to not shock the system. And basically the idea is that uh, even if we were to assume that we would get 2.5 percentage point increase in annualized returns. So, so, yeah. so you have probably the, the most kind of, um, you know, pull here, pull there. Yes. You know, yes. I would say kitchen sink kind of proposal. <laughs> You know, but it's what we've seen a lot of that hasn't happened yet, right? Right. So a lot of this, a lot of the ideas that you have here, are ideas that have been swirling around Washington. Why do you think you can sell this proposal to policymakers? Exactly. And the advantage of our proposal is that most of the other proposals don't have compromises and balances for both sides of the political aisle. They very favor. They very. Uh, much tilt or favor one political side, whereas this one includes certain things that some Democrats like and th certain things that Republicans. You, think you, Republicans you, you like? irritate everybody. <laughs> well, so in the and spirit, I was using and, the and term just irritate. Add, uh, <laughs> just to add one point finished. onto onto what Roy was saying, yeah. I think it's all in framing is going to be really critical here. And at the end of the day, this is a tax cut for 96 percent of Americans. Full stop. All right, we're done. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you guys. We welcome Team 3, Social Security for the Future from Harvard College, and UMass Lowell, Nathan Williams, PJ LeBanc, Satong DeClaire, and Caleb Schwartz. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah there.
Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm PJ. This is Sitong. This is Nathan. And this is Caleb. And we will be presenting to you Schooling the Social Security Crisis, which did not end up being the title of our slide, but that's OK. Uh, so our first thing is we do have a relatively similar end goal. Uh, to over and what your Delta team? Oh no, that's the other one. Your Renaissance. Renaissance. Uh, we will be removing the prohibitions against pre-funding. So that is trying to add marketable securities into the Social Security Trust Fund. It's very simple mathematics and a simple heuristic that if we take inflation and we add to it the differential between young people and entering the workforce and old people exiting the workforce and entering retirement, we're going to get something significantly higher than the 3% return that we have right now. So we need to add assets into the Social Security Fund or we will never achieve sustainability and will never achieve balance. In order to do this, however, that is a politically compromising move. To add stocks, for example, is to also move government into the business of business, to move government into the business of voting rights, and all sorts of other things that might compromise interests such as regulatory arbitrage. Our goal instead is to put in an injunction against any equity and move only into bonds. So Social Security will only be able to invest in specifically fixed income assets. Particularly, we find advantages for the Social Security uh, the Social Security Administration to invest in corporate, uh, in domestic corporate bonds, in taxable municipal bonds, and in student debt, particularly government insured student debt. And that will be the main focus of what we're talking about today. Uh, this will take a significant amount of time, between 10 and 12 years, as all of the bonds are callable, which means that we have pure 100% liquidity. But as Gary will tell you, if we try to dump $2.8 trillion into the stock market tomorrow, there's going to be a problem. <laughs> So in order to change that, we will be slowing that down a little bit. We will be rolling this over over the course of 10 to 12 years. The issue, of course, is that if we only fix our interest rate problem in 12 years, well, 2032 is when we're out of money. So we need to fix it before then. In order to do that, we will be increasing revenues. It's going to be politically painful to do, and we're going to see what we can squeak in. Uh, like Renaissance, we said that we'd like to levy a capital gains tax. We thought around 2.5%, which would be about a 7% amelioration of the budget shortfall. That is both capital gains income, uh, capital gains and unearned investment income, uh, so dividends as well. We would like to increase the income cap to $274,500 for the um, payroll earnings cap that would hit us to the that would bring us up to the 90th percentile of all wages paid in America and ameliorate the budget shortfall by 29 percent which will get us about halfway there together then we'll also you know, decrease one of the most intriguing pieces of, of your proposal and I know you're going through it and I'm afraid you're going to run out of time before you get there yep. is increased fertility rates by providing early um, benefits on parental leave. So ah. can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so um, what we'd like to do is, uh, like I said, we're really into student loans. And when we do that, we're going to uh, increase interest in higher education. The issue is if you look across demographics, when you increase higher education and the percentage of educated people in your population, you also drastically drop the birth rate. So we knew we needed to offset that or we're immediately going into the high cost situation as modeled by the OSAEDI. Uh, in order to offset that, what we're, going, what we're offering is that upon birth, uh, parents will be able to collect parental benefits for three months following the birth of their child. This will equal uh, 34, divided, so you add a zero in and you index someone's income based on the average of their prior years of income. Uh, and then discount it by 73%, but uh, details. Um, moving on from that <laughs> is um, so when you receive those specific benefits, you will uh, the cost for receiving those parental benefits, should you choose to do so, would be increasing the full retirement age on the back end. So if you choose to take your uh, parental benefits of three months after the birth of your child in order to pay for things like infrastructure of raising the child, so the crib, the formula, the diapers, all those things, all those costs that millennial parents are afraid of right now, would, we would help offset those costs. Um, and then on the back end, we would be able to keep budget neutral or even budget positive, depending on our discount rate, uh, by having a cost of three months of retirement in the future for anyone who takes those. Um, the, there is a significant amount of evidence to back this up that although the major gains in the birth rate will be in the short term, you can see anywhere from a 17 to a 36% increase in the birth rate in the short term, depending on which country you're talking about, by instituting parental benefits. Parental benefits that are significantly What's more your minor. Proof of that? What's your proof um, that, that increasing parental benefits will actually 
Well, uh, actually, yeah, so we have that source on the bottom because, wow, we ran out of time with the slide. Uh, but if you go into there, uh, there's a study in Germany. There's several studies across Europe, but there's a study particularly in Germany where they offered parental benefits of 400 euros per month for a year following the birth of a child. But they uh, didn't make people um, live longer or work longer. To further Social Security. Yeah. It, they're trying to increase the birth rate. Yeah, yeah. I know. that's good. Um, the di the difficulty with just adding money is that our budget is awful. So we need to. F so we are setting it at cost and with a discount in order to make it budget neutral. Um, if we have the spare funds after 12 years, then I would love to make it into uh, where we just offer parental benefits to anyone. Um, but right now, I don't think we have the budget to do that until at least 2034. Once we roll on to the full investment. Um, portfolio and are able to get compound. How does how does the refinancing of the student loans fit into this? I'm, I'm missing. Um, that piece. So part of the part of the one the, there's two really nice things about student loan debt in particular. The first is the government backing of uh, government subsidized and government issued um, loans, particularly um, the direct loans, are that uh, when you default or should you default, the cost comes to your social security. So people will oftentimes default at the age of 32, 34. Um, but the government is unable to garnish wages, so some people will simply stop paying them. And then on the back end, they start seeing significant garnishments up to 15% or below the poverty line of Social Security. We want to prevent that. And so we want that public conscious um, to, we want the public conscious of the young to be aware that they are paying, when they pay their student debts, they're paying into Social Security. And that allows them to collect Social Security in the future. The other part of it is there would need to be significant reform of the current student debt program. Um, but uh, that's, So what, what that's we really it. liked about your proposal when we read it is it seemed to put everybody uh, into a discussion about Social Security and social safety yes. net. But I think, I think we're, we're kind of losing you a little bit on where, where the student debt write down and what, what the savings is going to be and what the benefits so, are going to so be. So are you going to only buy student debt or are you going to buy other corporate bonds? I thought oh. it was just student debt. Oh. So we would like to remove the prohibition and buy, so there's only one trillion, there's only 772 billion student dollars of student debt right now. Right. So if we tried buying all, we could buy all of it from the Department of Education and then we still have 2.1 trillion left over. Yep. So it would diversify into other assets. Uh, we believe corporate bonds, you can get about 180 billion before you start disrupting the market. Municipal bonds, you can get like 25 billion, but it's really profitable. Um, and then beyond that, it would have to move so, into so, so either- So your basic plan is incre increase yield, tax capital gains, increase the cap, and give a uh, parental benefit for three months. And, and yes. we're at time. Yeah. Also and we're at time loans. here. People yeah. would save 5%. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice job. Well done. <laughs> Team four from the Harvard Kennedy School, of Kevin Frazier, Dabit Kanagati, Catherine Mateo, Chuck Nad, Brian Saylor, and Isaac Yoder. Test, test, test. And their fan base. Test, test. <laughs> Team four, Team Delta. I have two children, Mary Margaret, who's two years old, and Peter, who's one year old. When Mary Margaret turns 18, it'll be 2034, and when they're ready to retire, it'll be the early 2080s. So while they're playing with crayons right now and not too concerned with Social Security, the question of Social Security solvency is very real for me, and it's very real right now, as I am sure it is for many of you here in the audience today who have children or grandchildren who will be turning the age of maturity for Social Security at the time that this discussion is relevant. My name is Chuck Nadd. I'm Catherine Mateo. I'm Kevin Frazier. And I'm Brian Saylor. We're very excited to be here tonight submitting our proposal to fix Social Security. We've directed this proposal to Mayor Pete Buttigieg in order to harness the unique political men momentum of the 2020 election cycle to make real sub substantive progress in fulfilling our intergenerational, our intergenerational responsibility to Chuck's kids and future generations. Simply put, Social Security is spending more than it's taking in, which puts the uh, program on a path to insolvency over the next few decades. But moving along, the solution we have to offer is a four-pronged proposal that we like to call LIDS. Lift, include, diversify, secure. Step one, lift the current existing cap on payroll taxes such that all members of society contribute proportionally towards Social Security's future. Step two, include state and local government officials who have historically been excluded from Social Security benefits in order to expand the number of people contributing to Social Security in the short term. They've been excluded because they have state and local pensions, Exactly. Right? But so would, would, they, would they double dip 
would they be in Social Security and in state and local pensions? We're talking about new members who are joining state and local government today. So they wouldn't be in the state and local pension. They'd, want, they'd single dip. Correct. Yeah, it okay. would be an opt-in policy much like uh, some of our other proposals. Okay. So the third step would be diversity, diversity of investment opportunities for everyday workers by allowing everyday beneficiaries of Social Security to opt in to a second high benefits trust fund for an additional fee uh, on their payroll taxes. I'm, I'm sorry, on the lift of the flat payroll tax to earnings above 132, no cap on that? And, uh, no, so we'd effectively be eliminating the cap. Yeah. Okay, so you make a million dollars, you've got to pay the... The, the That's yep. exactly right. So our first point is lifting flat payroll tax above 132. You're lifting the cap is what you're lifting doing. the cap exactly. So right now, any income, any earned income over 132,900 dollars is not taxed. There is zero payroll tax on that. Yep. Our proposition is to lift that cap so that that payroll tax can be uh, made on any earned income, specifically earned income, because that is more politically tenable on any income over $132,900. Why do you think it's more politically tenable to tax earned income versus unearned income? Because history shows that that's the case. Uh, in Just because that that's what it is doesn't mean that, that, I mean, I could make an argument that people say you're disincentivizing investment by taxing investment income at a higher rate. I said, well, that by that theory, you're disincentivizing work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But, so, so why not tax them both equally? Because at a certain point, we have to deal with the realities that were dealt. If this changes going forward, there are means to change it within the legislation. But okay. we have to deal with the realities that we're at today. All right, go on to your next point. All right, the next point is for including uh, new state and govern local government employees. Currently, about 27% are estimated not to pay into Social Security. The bottom line is we need a lot more people paying into Social Security, and that's just not where we're at today. So we want to include state and local government employees so that they can start paying into the larger pot. Our third proposal is diversification. So we're going to create a second high benefit investment fund that will give individuals safe access to the equities market. In order to gain access to this market, individuals will pay an additional 2% payroll tax. And then fourth, we've but got- that, That's optional, right? It is optional. optional. So individuals can choose to be in the existing social security fund or to pay an additional tax and be in the second, the second fund. And fourth, we're gonna make people feel safe. So we're gonna set a minimum standard of benefits that, individual, that an individual knows that they'll receive at the time of retirement. And that'll be 125% of the poverty rate. Because we're convinced that a person that works for 30 plus years in America should know that when they retire, they'll, be, they'll have a decent standard of living and they won't live in poverty just because they chose to retire. And we believe that the 2020 campaign will, is a good moment and good energy that we can harness to make this a politically feasible proposal. And so that gets to our message and really centering on political tenability. And we have the three messages we need to reach voters. And that is ensuring everyone pays their fair share, making sure we're providing more options and better choices, and ensuring that we're increasing equity by providing more financial security. It's true that we're gonna receive opposition to this plan, but there's something for everyone here. Democrats will appreciate people paying their fair share. Republicans will be excited about our third high benefits diversified trust fund to invest in. And social security advocates are gonna be excited about setting a minimum benefit threshold. Now, another key thing to consider here is, does anyone here want their social security benefits cut? No. No, okay. so any so, plan so that has back, that. Let me go back to your numbers. So go back to your number page. Sure. Because your numbers are basically dependent upon people opting for the high <laughs> pay. So your numbers don't add up unless you get that bucket. That bucket yeah. needs like 18% participation. Yes. So and I'm just doing have, this out of my memory from the middle of the night. Yeah. So what we okay. have is uh, an estimate that this proposal can solve anywhere from 10 to 30% of right, the solvency. Right, but you need sort of 18 to balance. So what we, sort we, of. So what we looked was at the military's blended retirement strategy. And what we saw there is that when given the option, the military converted anywhere from 25 to 55%. And the reason why people, it was in the Marines that they converted at 55%, was because the Marines had people choose one option or the other instead of defaulting into one. So the, this is accompanied with a, with, a, with a requirement that individuals choose to be in either the regular Social Security fund or in the high benefit fund. Did you consider means testing benefits? For example, I'm drawing, I'm working full time drawing a pretty healthy salary from the U.S. Senate, but I'm also drawing full Social Security. Does that make sense? We didn't consider that proposal, and the reason why is because with these four proposals, we're not cutting benefits for anyone, and we're solving 100% of the solvency gap. Okay, so that was one of your criteria. That's correct. And the key here is we're not trying to 
just address solving the solvency gap. We want to improve Social Security. So we opted to set this minimum benefit threshold because people want a Social Security well, that's well, better than it but is But the, the, the 2% that you pay for the extra yes. more risky portfolio, higher returns, yeah. is that going to skew income demographics? Wealthier people are obviously going to choose that, right? Yeah. They've yes. got more income. They've got more disposable income. Relative to the current situation, this is certainly a more a more feasible way for everyday people to get involved with the stock market. I think the current figure that I've seen most recently is about 80% of stocks are owned by about 10% of people. 40% of Americans don't have any stocks at all. Uh, so relative to the status quo, I think this is a much easier way of getting Is, is this Mayor Pete's plan or is this your suggestion this is to not, Mayor This is Pete. our suggestion because we have this very right. real solution Thank you. for today. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Okay. This is our... We next welcome Team 5, Lifetime Social Security, all Harvard College students, Laura, Nikolai, Alexander Harris, Justin Lee, Trevor Levin, Lucas Schwartzberg, and Jeffrey Andrade. Welcome. Click, click ahead. Lifetime Social Security, Team 5. Okay. You ready to go? Yes. Go ahead. Hold the mic up. So the core insight of our proposal is that individuals have much higher discount rates than the federal government because they can invest in the market and get higher rates of return. This means that rather than sending people checks when they're late in life, the federal government can front load payments and give people smaller payments earlier on, keeping them equally as happy in net present value terms without any additional cost or needing to raise any additional taxes, at the same time keeping benefits in NPV terms the same. Now what this would look like under our proposal is we would discount um, the expected income in retirement of people at different ages according to their appropriate discount rate which we've calculated and can get into and we'd give them an annual payment uh, which is an annualized portion of that amount. Is this the before they retire? No, this starts at 18. They'd get the annual payments. Um, so the government would automatically, by default, invest 100% of this in a government-managed uh, market account that earns the market rate of return. But individuals would be able to withdraw up to 50% of those funds to smooth consumption or get them through tough times it, that suits their individual needs. In addition, another policy plank uh, that we have is that we would decouple benefits from income, which means that under the new system, all people would get the mean current payout in the status quo that they would receive in Social Security, regardless of whether in the actual status quo they would get more or less than that payment. This is a progressive element that we want to pair with individual flexibility. Now, we've done the math. I have some, we have some complicated calculations that we're happy to get into. We've but checked them all. They're yeah, right. Yeah. Oh, We're great. Good. Well, We're I'm good. glad. I'm glad. Um, but the model that we built <laughs> tells us that we would save over $74 trillion in expenditure on Social Security by 2090, which is $17 trillion in NPV terms. And while it would require an upfront investment and a greater budget deficit to pay people who otherwise wouldn't get payments for decades, the budget deficit would fall back to the projected 23 level in the status quo. To the projected level in the status quo by 2030. In addition, the additional uh, debt that we've accrued under this proposal in the first period of higher costs would be made up for by additional savings by 2042. You can also see the debt to GDP ratio output by our model and you can see that while it does rise above projections initially, it does fall s s drastically below the projections of the, the current CBO projections after 2042. So aren't you really asking, first off, um, uh, the, the policymaker to take a leap of faith? Right? Yeah, you got you got a front end problem. We're saying we got a problem with solvency. You're making it worse we with this proposal. And so when I look at this, I think, well, yeah, you know, it all seems good in theory, but the short term is pretty painful here. Well, right. sorry, uh, I would actually say the short term isn't that painful. So when you look at the projections, the deficit would be 800 billion in the first year, and it would continue going downwards. So if we are under this belief that we're currently in a crisis, well, in the 2008 crisis, we authorized an $800 billion uh, bailout package for the banks. So $800 billion in these senses is really not that much, especially, once again, if we look at the debt to GDP numbers, it never goes above 160%, which is below the debt to GDP ratio of m plenty of advanced economies, including three quarters of those in the EU. I, I got to tell you, this sounds like alchemy to me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that, that's I, I don't, I don't understand how you're spending a lot more money and it's going to save us. I mean, you've got to do, uh, one of the problems is you've got to ex explain this to, you know, 400, co a committee of 535 from all over the country. 
help me out here. Right, so we think of this basically as a down payment using the trust fund and deficit spending in the short term to ensure the long term uh, solvency of Social Security. Uh, it does but you're not in increasing revenues, right? Right. We do not touch taxes, which I think is a big point in the political fe feasibility. It's NPV. Again. If you understand NPV, you understand this But how understand do you give, a, give away more money and end up with the more? The NPV, compound interest, the way that I would explain this is give everyone a primer on how discounting works and how we calculate discount rates. No, that we means understand that it. you we can give it. people yeah. payments earlier. I'm sure you will understand, but I'm sure that your fellow congressmen would be able to understand if we gave them a primer on discount rates. After that, this makes total sense because you just front load payments and from a constant well, time that's, we, that's we, it's, it's a defined okay. contribution plan versus a defined benefit. Right, plan. Right. You're switching from what every right. private pension plan is doing. So the, the other piece of this that is curious to me and, and really interesting to me is the piece where you pretty much make this proposal, which is pretty conservative, right? But you like go off the rails on saying, okay, now we're going to guarantee a certain amount, what, 150 or, or 1,500 a month, right? You're going to guarantee. So if I'm, if I'm currently getting $900, a month in Social Security, you've just given me a huge increase, right? That's right. And, and you're taking away Angus's money that he was talking about, right? Well, we so don't touch current recipients at all. And, yeah. and people nearing Social Security, are, their benefits are barely touched. We have at an individual level, it basically the closer you are to, are to receiving Social Security, the less you're affected. What, what are you doing with the people that take their money early? So I, I'm in financial trouble. I take my 50% now. What do I retire on? So the um, so first of all, nobody would wind up uh, in. We would not be going back to the even people who do that. We're not going back to the days before Social Security. If you withdraw every single possible dollar, um, you still wind up with uh, approximately a seven hundred and fifty dollar a month check, and that's if you have absolutely no prudence. Yeah, seven hundred fifty dollar a month check doesn't buy you a lot. Well, that's for I was the one that did the faux pas on TV that said you could re right. remodel your kitchen but for $1,000. Remember? <laughs> the seven, but the, but the, the current minimum. famous so the by seven, the kitchen remodel comment. The, the $750 check would be for those making 15, 000, roughly $15,000 in annual income. Right. And so under the current system, those who are making $15,000 would receive $800 as their check. So this is really not that big of a hit. And that's if they save nothing beyond what they're absolutely required to. So you're saying someone, it, they started at 18, put money in, took money out from 50, at 55, and then they started collecting at 60, 65, they would only go down by $100 a month. Um, I don't know the math about that exact scenario, but... Well, I just um, optimized yes, it so, in my head. And, and we are, at the individual level, we phase it in gradually, so it's a weighted average of the mean payout versus what people have already earned. So, of course, this would be um, later on that people get only right. the mean. Are there any p points that we missed? Um, Some political yeah. viabilities. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Political viability. Um, so the big one is, uh, I think, the, no the big advantage is that it fixes the um, short-termism. Um, while the deficit increases, every voter immediately begins receiving a check, uh, or a deposit, rather. That's a big deal. Um, the deficit goes up. It, uh, it declines. Again, it's saving money by 2030. Um, and it's also, we do not touch current recipients, or, and we barely touch near recipients. For Democrats, we get a lot more progressive because we, teach, we treat future years worked as the mean. For Republicans, no new taxes, huge deficit savings. Yeah. Oh, thank Great. you. Great thank job. Thank you. Awesome. Perfect. Well, my congratulations to all five teams. We're going to be inviting our judges now to recess to the Institute of Politics for their own deliberations. But before we break, let me ask all five teams to yeah. stand so we can all acknowledge <laughs> your contributions. Do we get do we get to turn our mics off while we're deliberating? Yeah. Yes, the mics <laughs> will be turned I off. Turn off. I think I turned mine off. <laughs> We have snacks available during the deliberations for all uh, audience members right behind us here. And so enjoy yourself. We'll be back here in five or ten minutes with the judge's decision.
those weren't all our proposals. <laughs> it was literally like our proposal plus like an extra idea. Yeah. I think this 
Okay. Why don't we, um, if we could bring everyone together. Our judges have returned. If I could invite all of you to take a seat. Thanks, Martha. Let me, uh, if I could invite everyone to take your seat. The judges have returned. Their deliberations are complete. And we thank Senator case. Angus King and, of course, yeah. Senator Heitkamp and Gary Cohn for their uh, judging and for the important questions they asked. And, of course, Miguel and Abby are here with the placard that will be inscribed to the first place <laughs> team. So I'll turn it to visiting fellow Gary Cohn. I've been called a lot of things before. That's a new one. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you all for being here again. Um, look, it was, as you can see by the five teams that presented, that was the culmination of a lot of work last night to get to five teams. You can see we had a variety of, of themes here. We had uh, basically what I call defined contribution versus defined benefits, or you can invest better than we can. That's, that, that, that's what, I, that's what I, I would call it. you can invest better than we can. We had, you know, basically government buys student loans, owns student loans, and we can make you pay your student loans or we don't pay your Social Security. Interesting little arbitrage for the government. Very creative. I mean, we, Heidi and I had thought of a lot of ideas. We sort of guessed that concept was coming. We sort of guessed the libertarian concept was coming. Uh, it's, we're at Harvard. The libertarian concept has to come. We didn't guess the student loan concept was, was, was coming. So, no, no, that was that was ama amazing concept. Um, we, we had, you know, the, the, a bunch of you went into changing the caps, which we thought was, was really interesting. Um, we, we always thought the caps were in play. A bunch of you went into changing the age, which I think is, is right, because as longevity goes on, I think that, you know, we've got to match Social Security with age expectancy. The dirty little secret about Social Security when it was created, it was supposed to be a pure savings account. They made the, they made the payout date longer than life expectancy. So literally people were paying into Social Security and there was actuarially, you were never supposed to collect it. And then lo and behold, we've lived longer and longer and longer and people are collecting it longer and longer. A bunch of you talked about um, investing the proceeds in a more reasonable way, getting a more market-based rate of return, which was I think three or four, you had that in your proposal. So great, great to see that. We also liked um, some of the other issues that you were talking about, just, just thinking outside the box, thinking of other social issues that we had. So we were really, really pleased with what we had in doing our first hackathon here. Uh, Mark, we don't know if you at the IOP will ever <laughs> achieve this again or try this again or be willing to do it again, but I would encourage you to do it just with other fellows. <laughs> if, if you want Heidi and I to come back and judge, maybe we'll yeah, do that. Maybe. But uh, we, we want to thank you all for, for participating. And then uh, we'll all make some, some quick remarks and then we'll, tell you the winner. We're going to keep you in suspense a little yeah. longer. I, 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 think, I think it was really creative to think about what does the workforce look like into the future? And you know that if you've been attending the study groups, you know that's an issue that we address almost weekly. And I think, I, I think that, that the challenge was to solve through a period of time, but yet you guys really thought and, and made, I think, a really compelling case that we don't know what kind of social safety net we're going to need. And so maybe this one's too antiquated to actually repair. Maybe we we need something else. And I think you guys, you guys kept it simple. That's really, really important in a proposal like this to not have too many moving parts. But, um, you know, I, I, I am still intrigued and I think probably we'll have nightmares about your proposal. <laughs> um, uh, because because when, we fir when you first presented it, I was knocked over by how incredibly smart you all are and, and um, committed you are to this idea. When we read through the proposal, we were blown away by how, how detailed it was, especially on the math, and how you really thought through this. I mean, Gary made it simple, but you didn't make it simple. You really made a compelling case. And you guys, I mean, really, really creative. It's like, it's like Gary said, we never thought we were going to get a proposal um, on, on, uh, that, had, that linked the new generation. You know, to said to, you got a problem with Social Security? How do we get young people to care? Well, let's put them in, as investors in Social Security. 
security. Let's talk about what young families can get out of a social safety net. Let's broaden the concept of what social security should be. And I thought that was really compelling and very interesting. But at the end of the day, we're going to find a proposal that we think we don't have to you know, go there and, 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 and really sell. So Angus, you want to make some? Well, I think we're gonna, we have to pick a winner. But in going back to Washington, I suspect I'm going to take little pieces <laughs> uh, from various, uh, and, and I think there, there really are some important concepts. Uh, the, the whole idea, I've never been able to explain to a guy who's a truck driver why he should pay 35% on his income, and a guy who gets a check in the mail as a dividend pays 20%. I mean, that's, that's a hard thing. Try to explaining that when you're shaking hands at a mill somewhere. Uh, and I think that's mm -hmm. part of the solution. And the, the whole way many of you treated uh, age and those things. On the question of when Social Security was invented, the retirement age, I think, was 72, and the average longevity in the country was 66. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it was a pretty good economic bet at that point. <laughs> yeah. It's sort of like a friend of mine who pointed out that when the Lord invented till death do us part, the average lifespan was 29. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, you, you didn't, didn't hear contemplate that over there, did 50-year marriages. She's, she's shaking her head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder I'm your favorite senator, Mary. <laughs> Anyway, no, these were, this was really wonderful, and, but I, and, and you should know there was a little precursor, those of you who are in the audience, we met with the teams before and told them, look, you have a very limited amount of time, so don't spend a lot of time telling us what the problem is. In Washington, we got to tell them what the problem is. Because 2034, as you pointed out, Gary, in political t time is, is ages. The truth is, every month that goes by that we don't fix this, it gets harder to fix. So the political chore is to get the political class agitated and worried enough to address this now rather than wait until 2030, which is typically uh, the way we do these things. So uh, super job. I'm, I'm just uh, uh, stunned by by the creativity and the analysis that you've done. So great job. Gary, you're gonna... So one more thing yeah. before we announce the winner. We're gonna keep you in suspense. Yeah. We have our study group, Heidi and I, yeah. have our final study group together at 7.30 upstairs in the normal room upstairs. Star Auditorium. Star Auditorium. Uh, we're going through immigration today. We've got a lot Another of interesting really easy talks one. on immigration. <laughs> it's a very simple topic that no one really cares about in the United States. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're going to talk about immigration, the economic impacts of immigration, both pros, pros and cons of what's going on in immigration, immigration policy, how we need immigration, and what's going on there. And with that, I think we're ready to announce a winner. Okay. We got to sign first. Yeah. Some more suspense. Here. Okay. More suspense. I'm not that nervous. <laughs> While they are signing, let me especially thank Gary and Senator Heitkamp for visiting us with us this semester in really adding so much to our community. Join me in thanking the Senator. Now, if Gary were signing a check for you, it'd be worth a lot of money. <laughs> so? So someone has to win in the end. Yeah. And um, we think that the proposal that probably would present as most viable and um, could find its way actually into legislation is Team Renaissance proposal number two. <laughs> Come, on Come on up, up gentlemen. Hey, can all the teams... Oh, all the teams, stay take, right where you are. We're going to want a picture with everyone in a minute. Come yeah, on up, guys. Wait, we're going to take a picture, so don't scoot let's, out. Let's take the winners first, here. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank you. I'll be right. the short girl in the front. When you threw you the bet. capital gains you and you had me. Yeah, yeah. You, you wait until I get you in front of the committee to preserve Social oh, Security and Medicare. Yeah, here you go. Here you go. Thank you so much. Yeah. Here you go. Come on. You can talk among yourselves now while we're doing this. All, right, all the teams, come on All the teams, all come, the teams. On. come on. Including, come on. including our great high school team. Come on up. Come on. Come on up. Come on, your Come honorable on mention to us. Your Come on honor, up, the important. high school team. Okay, so we got to step up. Come on, get up. Come on. <laughs> oh, we picked the right one? Okay, we picked the right one? Good. They had almost my plan. You're the youngest. <laughs> almost my plan. Yeah, you guys can actually get up after you've been on your knees. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, high school kids on the knees. There you go.
So, so everybody, one, two, three, you can save Social Security. Okay. <laughs> two, two, three. three. You, you can, can save, save Social, Social Security! Security. <laughs> Great. All right. Congrats Thank you, you so much. Congratulations. Thank you, nice guys. Good job. Really well yeah, done. Yeah, you guys did great. Yeah, great to meet you. Thank you God guys you guys really, were a real It was job. a very you know, compelling well, what argument what happened, yeah, at the <laughs> end. You know, it was just like so hard. Yeah, sure. <laughs> really, really yeah. good. Uh, yeah. Thank you. You guys are good. Thank you. Is that you way you look familiar? You Thanks, you guys. I kept looking at you. I go, I know okay. that girl. We're going to take another picture with all of us. Hey, Gary. Gary, I think they want you in a picture. They want you in a picture.